Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this InfraReady Peer Spotlight webinar. Uh, my name is Carlos Mancada. I'm Director of Client Services. Uh, and the webinar today is titled Managing a Strategic Investment Fund. Uh, our presenter today is Nina Bates from the University of Arizona. Uh, she's with the Office of the Provost. Uh, before we get into uh, having Nina present, I'm going to go over the logistics logistics with you. Uh, we also have a poll question that's launched. Uh, if you'd be so kind, please fill out that that uh, poll question. Uh, uh, on top of that, uh, some of you might not be fully aware of it, of InfraReady, so I have a little bit of information for you to share with you on that. So on screen here, uh, we've got a slide uh, sharing what sits sets InfraReady apart. Um, and, the, and so InfraReady is a SaaS product, so cloud software. Uh, it's fully self-service, uh, so no IT support is needed. It really is. It really does empower uh, the administrative users uh, to manage their own process. Uh, additionally, uh, InfraReady allows you to create your own templates or to use uh, InfraReady templates to launch quickly. Uh, you know, there's you don't need to spend too much time uh, to, to get started and launch uh, uh, an opportunity or a workflow or a competition. Another great thing about InfraReady is that you can run an unlimited number of competitions with a different number of administrators. Now, a great thing about that is that you can experiment or you don't have to worry about uh, limiting the number of processes you may manage in the system. Uh, Another thing to note about InfraReady uh, is because it's uh, a platform, it's centralizing all of the data from all the different stakeholders involved in the process. So you really have to, uh, you can really take an opportunity to have, to, to improve your data management uh, for reporting purposes, uh, for better oversight over the operations uh, and to better manage uh, your processes. Uh, two more notes here. Really fast implementation time. That's a quick, easy solution to implement. Uh, you can be up and running in, in on average four to six weeks. Uh, we've done it faster for some folks uh, that have that are facing deadlines on launching an opportunity. So definitely available, but you know we advertise four to six weeks. And lastly, uh, for all of those who've used InfraReady. Uh, you have probably said to yourself, man, they have really great support and training over there. And, and we hear that across the board and that's what you'll get uh, with InfraReady. So uh, the basic concept of InfraReady of being able to collect a form or a submission or application then run it through a workflow is used all throughout campus. And, and we've seen that uh, happen uh, across the board, all over institutions, multiple institutions. And here's an example of all the different of different ways people are using the platform. This is not an exhaustive list, but you can see there's competitive processes, there's non-competitive processes. There's processes in a provost office, a research office, a grad school, a med school, college of engineering, etc. And we can share this list with you if you're interested. Uh, just follow up with us. There's a survey at the end. Um, where, where you have space to, to ask that. Uh, now, for today's schedule, uh, the presentation by the panelists will take around 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes, uh, and there'll be Q&A for around 30 minutes. So all that adds up to a one-hour webinar. Now, all the phones are muted, so if you do have a question, please use the webinar Q&A uh, feature to submit your question. And then if you've said, if you say to yourself, oh, gee, I wish one of my colleagues could be here, that's okay because we're recording this webinar and we'll share it with you afterwards. And lastly, there's that post-webinar survey I mentioned. That's going to open up a browser window or a browser tab when you exit the webinar. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to fill that out, it would be really helpful for us on, on continued programming. Uh, having said that, it's time to turn to our main feature here, which is 
presented by Nina Bates, uh, Director of Operations and Strategic Initiatives in the Office of the Provost at the University of Arizona. Uh, so I have a, a bio to read. Uh, she is responsible for leading teams and projects, building and strengthening relationships, and mobilizing resources to successfully implement provost strategic initiatives and projects that often span organizational boundaries, such as the Provost Investment Fund, Student Success District, and other various IT and capital projects. She is originally from Indonesia and moved to the U.S. to begin her career at the University of Arizona in 2003. She received her undergraduate education from Sanata Dharma University in Indonesia, a master's degree in educational psychology from the University of Arizona, and a master's degree in administration from Northern Arizona University. Nina also holds a project management professional certi certificate from the Project Management Institute, so a PMP from PMI. And then some fun facts. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling, wine tasting, and riding motorcycles. So uh, if you have questions about the type of motorcycle Nina runs, I'm sure we could get that answered in some way. Now, having said all that, I turn it over to Nina Bates. Nina, your show. Thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share our experiences in managing strategic investment. Uh, like Carlos said, I'm from Indonesia. I moved to the US uh, about 20 years ago to work for the University of Arizona. So I've been here for 20 years now. And I uh, studied in the Provost Office about 10 years ago. Uh, to manage the Provost Investment Funds and also to lead various uh, strategic projects. Our next slide, please. Before we proceed with the presentation, uh, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes from Tucson being the home to the Autumn and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationship with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnership, and community service. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, some of you may, may uh, manage some strategic investment or some funding coming from central funding, right? So before we came across quite a bit of challenges in managing strategic investment. First of all, we received a lot of this elevator pitch to the provost. Like, hey, I have this, this project, I have this program, would you like to fund it? And then it was also difficult for us to track those uh, funding commitments because they come from various uh, sources, can be from email, can be from text, can be from like meeting notes after the meeting. So personally, it was very hard for me managing the, the funding to keep track of those and also to make sure that we transfer the funds appropriately to the department. And then another challenge is that we have, if we have very limited or little documentation to support the, to support the request. We do not have uh, the goals or maybe uh, the outcomes that we would like to achieve, how they would, uh, uh, how they measure their success or how they would like to implement it. So uh, we we had some challenges in, in documenting those. Also, some people do not, did not know that we had such funds. So it seems like uh, it appeared that only certain people who knew the existence about the fund could ask for, for the funding. So we've, over the years, we've made some improvement and then we're so glad when we came, came across InfoReady uh, through our research office. So we started to have a competitive process for requesting funds from the Provost Investment Funds starting in spring 2019. And we have the following uh, guiding principles. So we want to make sure that the process is transparent because the funding comes from the annual allocation from our budget model, which is the activity-informed budgeting. So from the institution, uh, from the revenue that coming in for, to the university, 
we set aside or carve out uh, a funding dedicated for investment uh, or innovation funding that are directed to uh, the provost office and also uh, the research office for their research development fund. So we receive about between 20 to 24 million uh, annual allocation for provost investment funds. So we want to make sure that the fund that we receive, we invest it back to, to the colleges. That's why we want to make sure that the process uh, uh, is transparent and also how we utilize the fund. We have annual report that we send out to campus community and leadership to make sure uh, that we meet this guiding principle of transparency. Also, we would like to be nimble and proactive in funding high impact projects, specifically that align with the university strategic goals and our ambition to be uh, distinct and excellent. So we, uh, the university has set up these five pillars for our strategic plan, as you see here on the, on the screen, Wildcat Journey, Grand Challenges, Arizona Advantage, Arizona Global, and, and, and Institutional Excellence. So we want to make sure that those proposals submitted, the, uh, the project or initiative that we fund, they're all aligned to our strategic goal. And we also to make sure that the, the, uh, the process and also the programs or the initiative are collaborative and interdisciplinary. We notice that a lot of programs are silo. Uh, departments are doing the same thing pretty much. So by having it, um, a, a competitive uh, a PIF competitive selection, we encourage collaborations between departments to ensure that we provide a, a campus-wide service to our student uh, faculty and staff and community. Next slide, please. So I mentioned before our competitive uh, submission process started in spring 2019. Uh, as you see, uh, in spring 2019, we allocated close to 6 million that year. We learned very quickly at that time because we received a very uh, kind of like a kitchen sink type of proposal because we did not uh, have uh, funding priorities uh, uh, at that time. So we just say we have fund available, please submit your, your request. And we also received a lot of proposals that are like high dollar amount. So at that time, uh, we were able to only uh, fund few proposal with high dollars. So we learned very quickly at that time to make sure we have funding priorities and set up a funding range for Provost Investment Fund so we are able to fund more, more initiatives. Uh, we did not have any com uh, competitive submission in fall 2022, I'm sure we all try to forget what happened that, that, that time with the pandemic, there are a lot of things uh, put on hold. Uh, we also uh, partner with other um, constituents on campus, such as Hispanic Serving Institution Initiative and the Tech Launch Arizona. We tried, we received so many great proposals through the Provost Investment Fund, and we tried to, um, we cannot fund them all, so we tried to uh, find different source of funding from other, uh, other sources for those proposals that are very strong. And again, to, to meet the, guide, uh, find the guiding principle of transparency, we have annual reports available on our website. Next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned earlier about funding priorities. These vary um, uh, depending on the, the strategic goals that we have, but for over the past few years, it has been very steady that we would like uh, to receive proposal that increase student success, graduation, and retention, especially underrepresented minorities. Uh, we would like proposal that promote growth and opportunities to generate new net revenue to the university. Uh, we also would like to see expanding uh, proposal that expands student experience and learning, including undergraduate research opportunities, and those that enhance research capacity so we do not we do not accept like very research type of proposal specific for a uh, faculty research, for example, because our uh, research uh, innovation and impacts they have specific grants for for those or specific competition and fundings for those. We want a research uh, proposal that actually enhance the whole research activity at the University of Arizona. And then lastly, uh, the funding area is the promote to promote diversity and inclusion in the university. 
So I mentioned over here uh, on the right side, the proposal categories and re all relevant operational areas. This is the kind of selection that the applicant can self select the up to two to make sure that they're kind of like really focused uh, of what they're, they're proposing. So we divide them into these cat categories, academic, instructional program, instruction, or research infrastructure, student support, employee support, and administrative support project. This will also help me when you know, we receive an average of 100 proposal every semester. So I'll be able to kind of review the proposal and put those into buckets of this category because they will go through different reviewers. Next slide, please. So for our progress investment fund, we have two cycles, one in the fall and one in the spring, as you see here, when we open for submission, uh, the submission deadline and our official response. So we particularly enjoy the fall semester because uh, we uh, send out the notification before the holidays. So uh, we feel like we're giving a Christmas present to, to campus communities. And, and this, is, this has become sort of like a, a very, Faculty, staff, and campus community, they await for when the Provost Investment Fund will be launched. So they, they're they looking forward for, for receiving the, the notice that it's been open. So we typically have about 1 million per cycle to be awarded, but sometimes we, we find it very, very difficult to choose which one to fund, and we ended up funding more. Uh, so on average, we probably fund about 1.3, 1.5 million every year, actually. So the funding, uh, the request for the fund, the funding range is about 15 to 100,000 per year for a maximum of two years. So uh, PIF is, we, we call it one-time funding, temporary funding and not ongoing. Of full-time faculty and staff, uh, department heads, chair, directors, uh, they may uh, apply for the, for the funding. We go through everything through InfoReady. So they've been a lifesaver for me for managing this uh, twice a year. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people involved in very rigorous process. So we, the proposal submission, the review, the award notification, and the progress report are all done using InfoReady, which we rebranded to be called Arizona Cultivate. Next slide, please. So I mentioned here about uh, our rigorous PIF review process. So when we receive PIF proposal, we make sure we review to make sure they um, uh, include all the required submission material. And if they are not complete, uh, we're able to return it to the applicant within InfoReady and then applicant can resubmit. So we make sure that everything is all ready and categorized accordingly before I send it to the review committee. I mentioned before that we divide the committee into uh, five different categories. Sometimes we created a sixth category because we couldn't, we couldn't put some proposal into a specific category. Uh, those committees will, will review, provide their score and evaluation based on the, the following evaluation criteria. Strategic alignment with the university strategic goal, alignment with our funding priorities, and then also we evaluate them based on the proposal return of investment or value on investment. Uh, they have to be very specific as well in terms of project plan, implementation plan, timeline, and stuff like that. Uh, that's a pretty high uh, way on our evaluation and the highest kind of way uh, of our evaluation is funding sustainability. We mentioned uh, previously that PIF is only funded for two years. So a strong proposal that we, we usually fund, they're able to kind of explain how they can be financially sustainable beyond the PIF fund. So that is a very strong uh, evaluation criteria for us as well as the return of investment. So um, once the committee reviews, uh, each subcommittee based on those categories, they will meet and discuss. And each subcommittee will 
recommend about three to four proposals to be funded to the, to the provost. So from five different categories, we ended up about 15 to 20 strong proposal recommended for funding. And then the provost and I and other folks on, on in our office will review them. And then uh, we make a decision uh, of which one to fund. Uh, the peer review, we have faculty, staff, and students. So every cycle, we send out a call for nomination to be reviewer. So we open that up to all campus community and uh, we make sure that they have a, a, a variety of backgrounds and expertise to be able to, to review our PIF process or, or, or PIF proposal. So we have about 30, 35 reviewers per cycle. And, um, and uh, the reviewer are asked to provide feedback on the strength and the weaknesses for each proposal. And then I will summarize them and then send that to the proposal. This is actually very, very helpful because we want to provide some safe place for faculty and staff to sort of practice submitting grant, right? So we know that uh, um, it's a little bit intimidating to, to submit a proposal. So we provide this uh, kind of safe place for them to, to try because they have three opportunities to submit uh, for PIF funding. So based on the feedback that they receive from the committee, they, they usually revise their proposal and resubmit. And some, you know, most of the time, or uh, very often, they actually uh, ended up to be funded in the next cycle. And then the, uh, our goal to include the campus communities as well is to um, provide professional development for staff and faculty to be able to be uh, practice to be good reviewers. Uh, so they can serve in NSF or NIH uh, funding. And then for the staff, very rarely we get the opportunity to do something like that in our capacity as staff member. So we want to give some kind of exposure of, of evaluation and review process to our staff member. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So these are lesson learns and best practices that we've learned uh, over the years. Uh, again, during, when we launched the first competition, we did not have a specific funding priority. So I recommend to have funding priorities. You may change that every year or every cycle, uh, depending on your institutional needs. But it's very, very important to set that um, and then be clear about it. Because if not, you will have a kitchen sink of proposal for a variety of, of reasons or, or purpose. And then uh, assign proposal into categories or uh, relevant operational areas. This will be very helpful for uh, the administrators to kind of send them into bucket. And also to make sure that you have, when you award proposal, you do not focus on funding proposal that are in certain areas. So for example, it will be too heavy on the infrastructure, but not on the new academic program or not on the student support. So by having them in uh, assigned to be in different categories, you'll be able to kind of uh, fund the funding across the board. Uh, make sure you set up funding limits uh, and also the period of time because strategic investment tend to be to vary uh, each year. And then you will have the opportunity sort of like, okay, we cannot do it this semester or we will reduce the amount for, for this cycle. So. Uh, to be clear on the funding limits and the amount and the period of funding would be very important. We don't want ongoing commitment coming from uh, central funding because it's very hard to kind of change that after, after that. Uh, create a very thorough, uh, a thorough submission guidelines that includes you know, how the purpose is going to be evaluated what are, uh, how many words for, uh, or how many characters, because if not you, uh, in the first year, we ended up with like 51 pages of proposal uh, because uh, a lot of people include their curriculum vitae, their references and stuff like that. So make sure you're very clear on, on that. And, uh, uh, so this is about InfoReady. You'll be able to pull data from InfoReady uh, any way you want it, but you have to include the question or the information in the form. So think about, okay, I would like to
full certain report uh, on uh, through info ready about like the total amount of requests in one cycle. So you need to create a question within within um, info ready and the, like how much they're actually asking for year one or year two. Because as, as I mentioned before, you know, any report that you pull from InfoReady is only available if you request the data in the system. Uh, I The next one about the submission deadline, I learned it the hard way. So usually, you know, very common, we have like Friday at five o'clock and then uh, people are waiting until the last minute to submit their proposal. And then on the weekends, I ended up working overtime or even late because uh, I become technical support for, for campus committee to submit their proposal because they're stuck. Uh, uh, so this is why I changed it to weekday around noon. So I will have the opportunity to help them more and not taking into my uh, family time on the weekend. Okay. Uh, the next one is to involve campus committee in the review process. So uh, we send out the, the call for reviewer to campus community. So they're part of the the, the review process and to recommend for, uh, to recommend the proposal for funding. This will allow us to kind of gain insight and also expertise from various campus because we, we do not know everything that is happening on campus. So sometimes we have a proposal regarding student success in a department, and then we have a reviewer coming from a department, a central uh, support, for example, oh, we have such, um, um, service already, why don't they collaborate with Central? So having community, uh, campus community to be involved in the review process, uh, we have a very thorough um, uh, evaluation um, and review on the proposal. But also uh, we joke all the time that uh, when we have somebody we did not get fined, like why you did not find my proposal? We say, oh, talk to the reviewer. Uh, so it's just uh, a joke we've been in the office. Um, we continue to find, um, to uh, improve our process. So we send out a survey uh, to, to various uh, member of community. We also send survey to uh, the staff member who help faculty member in submitting, submitting proposal. And we also send um, a survey to faculty and staff about our peer process. So we continue, uh, we continue to improve our, uh, our process for the purpose investment funds. Right. I think that's it. Unless I'm I'm ready for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Yes, we do have some questions. Uh thanks for for providing uh an overview of the Provost Investment Fund. I think that's uh, really helpful. You covered so many different areas of how it's managed. Um, you know, sometimes I think when we take on an initiative, we forget, uh, we don't think about some of the small details that really help make it run smoothly. And you provided some great insights into some of those areas on top of the big picture as well. Uh, so starting with Q&A, if you're ready, I'm ready. I think the audience is ready too. All right. Uh, question, do you have any issues obtaining the 30 to 35 reviewers and coordinating them to review and input their thoughts in time? Very quick question. So this is when Info Ready helped me a lot in, in the review process. So uh, in the, in within Info Ready, so after we receive a uh, proposal, we actually assign those proposal into reviewers. And because I assigned them to six different uh, subcommittees, right? So uh, maybe one category will have six reviewer in 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 uh, to review the proposal, and then they will enter and score everything in within InfoReady. And this is what's so nice about InfoReady is that if they haven't finished their review, InfoReady will send them an automatic kind of like. Uh, a reminder every the way we set it up is every Monday morning and Thursday morning until they all complete their review. So uh, there is an email sent to them to to kind of remind them uh, to do that. 
So uh, I also set up a deadline and then uh, for, for the reviewer to, to review. And I give some kind of a little bit of time, like a buffer before we start uh, uh, scheduling the meeting. But I think uh, I also do what is called reviewer orientation every cycle. So we basically, uh, we, I meet with all the reviewers and just to kind of get their commitment and also to ensure that they know that this is a very important process for us and we value their, their feedback and insight. And um, that way uh, they, they know before they start getting their, their proposal to review that they know what they get into. So I very rarely, I get like last cycle, I have 100% completion uh, in some of review. Uh, submitted by the reviewer. So I think I think once we get some kind of a sense of community and they uh, they know how important it is, I think it will be it's, it's not difficult to get them to to review. A hundred percent completion rate from your reviewers is very impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so another a follow-up question on on reviewers. Do you look to, since you have different types of stakeholders, faculty, staff, students, are you looking for a certain ratio there? Um, no, I look for expertise, mostly based on the proposal that we submit. Uh, but we, we have quite a bit of actually a good number of faculty and staff, a good, a good ratio. Uh, we're lucky if we get students very often we get uh, graduate students to participate but uh i think we have we have about like maybe 60 35 60 faculty 35 staff and then five percent student at, at the moment i would like to get more students in the process and yeah, no, that that makes sense, uh, since the types of uh, you know operational areas really do touch on students more than other types of funds would. Uh, couple couple questions here. Uh, how much training uh, does you do you and other administrators need? Uh, how realistic is it to have an administrator up and trained and the site functional? So I guess from your personal experience, uh, how was that? So I'm the only administrator at the moment for the Provost Investment Funds. We have uh, we use info ready for other uh, purposes like faculty awards, and I have another administrator managing that. But this is the thing about info like you guys have a very good training, uh, uh, like refresher and stuff like that. But also. Uh, when I sort of uh, like start, especially if I want to implement something new, uh, the tech support from InfoReady is very, very helpful. You can set up one-on-one -on -one meeting and then you can show sort of, okay, this is a template that I would like to use. How how can we make it better? So I've been getting, uh, Sarah especially is very helpful, especially in the um, evaluation criteria because I want some weighted criteria. So she was able to resolve that. So I've, you know, I love IT, so maybe, you know, I'm, I'm biased, but I actually, you know, it did not take a lot of uh, time for me to, to do the training. And this is what's so nice. Once you establish a very good template for your competition, right, you can copy it for the next one. And all you need to do is update, you know, so the copy uh, function is, is, is really, really helpful. So uh, I have a backup just in case, uh, backup administrator in, in, within our, our office, just in case I need some help, but it's pretty straightforward, uh, pretty easy. And I'll be happy to share my template too with you all and you can copy it. I don't know, Carlos, maybe something like a in strategic investment template or something like that we can share to the, to the group or feel free to reach out to me personally. The, yeah, the, there's a feature within the system that allows you to share templates with other mm -hmm. admins, not just within your own institution, but with other institutions as well. So uh, that that can be done pretty quickly, sharing the templates. Someone could reach out to you today and say, hey, 
yes, I'd like to take you up on sharing that template. And they could have it today. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> uh, just um, following up on your point re regarding training, uh, we have uh, sig a significant number of training modules. Uh, the really well organized. The support team has done a wonderful job of of, of putting all of that content together. Uh, you can use interact with that in an asynchronous way and in bite sized uh, training bits, uh, so that you don't have to do it all in one go. Uh, the other thing that Nina mentioned there were the training webinars. She mentioned training refresher specifically, but we have one or two training webinars a month to cover different topics. And so if you haven't taken advantage of those yet, I, I do recommend it because people find them really helpful. Uh, and, and of course, that consulting time as well. Um, so moving, moving on to another, another question here, um, how much time do you spend on managing from beginning to end? So it, well, it's, uh, because we want to make it, it's, I believe Provost Investment Fund uh, in our office has been very successful because we do a lot. We really invest a lot of time. So I guess the time depends on how uh, you would, you know, if you just want to send out the competition and then have people apply, review, and then um, review and then announce the, the awardee. But we actually put a lot of care. So uh, we have like PIF, kind of workshop, you know, so once we announce the PIF call, we have a workshop for uh, faculty and staff who are interested in uh, submitting PIF application. So we put together that uh, every semester we have a, a workshop on, uh, on how to submit a strong proposal and we invite a past reviewer and past awardee to share their experiences. So we have that to kind of help uh, Spread the, uh, spread the word, but also to make sure that we get a strong proposal. And then we also have sort of like a meeting, a kind of like a, a network meeting for PIF awardees so they can get together and collaborate more and solve each other problem. So we hold that every year as well for the all the PIF awardees from the same year to meet. And then we notice that they collaborate more and, 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 and there is that, a connection and interdisciplinary uh, uh, activities between with, uh, uh, among the among the awardees. Uh, we also have that PIF reviewer orientation that we put together to help reviewers uh, to prepare them to review the proposal. So do, you know, depending on how you would like to implement this, but I think um, I, I do know how. It, in some of time, but I think once the 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 legwork it is at the beginning of the process when you when you start it because you need to have a very good um, submission guideline. So I think that takes quite a bit of time uh, to put that together and also to um, uh, to establish funding priorities and also to teach uh, our bosses like, hey, direct them to. <laughs> Do not approve via email or don't take the elevator pitch. Direct the people if they ask funding to you, please direct them to to the the competitive process. So I hope that answered the question. No, it, it, I think it did. Thank you. Yeah, it the work up front to to organize everything and and promote it and get people's minds uh, understanding. Uh, what's involved in submitting a, a successful proposal, definitely important. And then having the technology set up to, to be able to move everything through the, the workflow and process, definitely uh, important, I would say. Um, another question for you here. What tips do you have for everyone uh, for managing competitions with a high volume of submissions? Right. So I can share my experience, uh, my personal experience, because I'm the only administrator uh, for the Provost Investment Funds. And I also um, 
have other kind of uh, duties <laughs> in the purpose office. Uh, the way I kind of manage this for me to, to have this process manageable for me is uh, I do not wait until the uh, the deadline to kind of look at the re look at the proposal coming in because that would be very very uh, very hard to do when you have a hundred proposal by the deadline. So a lot of the maybe about fifty percent of the proposal they already submitted prior to the deadline. So and for ready you will send me. I, I I set it up that please notify me when a proposal is submitted. So it shows up in my email. So I have time to actually okay I go back. And then review to make sure that they have all the documents uh, and the, all the requirements included in the proposal. And then I already know which category I need to I need to put them. So uh, that way, uh, as the proposal coming in, by the time you know the, the submission deadline, I pretty much fifty percent, sixty percent done with putting them into bucket. Because then I'll be I have about two days to kind of send them to to the reviewer. So I think going instead of waiting at the after the submission deadline to review is very, very helpful. And then utilize the automated process within InfoReady to kind of take care of the manual work, to have the system work for you, uh, su such as sending reminder and also um, like even a notification like I have a template already done for like rejection, those who are not funded, because InfoReady will uh, give you the ability to send patch notification uh, and then uh, patch uh, email, but also you can patch uh, proposal, like these 10 proposal will go to this reviewer, you can patch them as well. So I learned a lot of the tool, like the strength of the system and I use them at my full potential. So I think that's how I can manage it uh, because I I make the technology works for me. No, I I agree. Um, you know, the technology is there to help patch things together, help help yes. you, uh, you know, reduce the amount of effort needed when when the when you do have high volume. Uh, we've got a we had a question. Where can we find the training web in our recordings? We will sub provide a link to that here in the Q and A, and 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 possibly a chat as well. So if anyone's looking for that, uh, it will be right there. Uh, here's another question for you, Nina. I'm going to stop sharing on this one um, because you might be sharing your screen for this. Where did the funds for the this investment fund come from? I'm going to stop sharing so you can. Very good questions. Uh, let me share our, so we, the University of Arizona, we use activity informed budgeting as our budget model. So within the um, uh, activity informed budgeting budget model, there is a specific allocation carve out for investment and innovation funding. So we receive, you know, sort of like the revenue coming in to the university from undergraduate tuition, graduate tuition, and other sources of fund flow into uh, the university. And then we, you know, the, the colleges will get based on their student credit hours, strategic will based on their goals and strategic uh, initiative, a strategic invest, not strategic investment, strategic plan. But then this is the part that is carved out for Provost Investment Fund and also uh, Research Development Funds and other funding. So this is uh, the allocation that we get. For our office, we receive between 20 to 24 million annual allocation. So if the tuition revenue is steady, then our allocation is steady. So it fluctuates every year. But so far, our enrollment has been very steady. So we receive about 24 million. So I don't know what budget model that university is, is using. Uh, previously, we have centrally, uh, um, responsibly central management uh, a budget model uh, many years ago. And there is also a carve out uh, uh, allocated funding for uh, strategic investment. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think 
I think that answered the question. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. So we have this, this, the wrong slide on screen. That's why I wanted to share my screen to put the wrong slide on screen. No, uh, uh, another question that has come in asked, uh, is your organization considering leveraging infrared in other areas as listed on the infrared use case list? So I'm just displaying the use case list so everyone can see it. Um, and uh, Nina, I think you can you you can probably answer this more for you for the provost office. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for the provost office, we use it for uh, faculty awards. So we have like distinguished faculty, um, outreach distinguished outreach faculty, we have uh, early career awards uh, and so many different awards that we use in ready to manage that. Uh, honorary degrees, yes, we, we do the submission in, uh, through honorary degrees. But the one that right now that we're testing is actually to use in for ready for um, gen ed course. So sort of like to see if we can work for course approval. Uh, so we're testing that and see how, how it goes later. And, and to answer that more broadly for the University of Arizona, I know they're using it in their central office of research, mm -hmm. uh, their cancer center, um, a couple institutes, uh, I think the school of social work, uh, the, there's, there's a couple more, uh, colleges there where, where they're using info ready. Um, to manage different types of processes, it, like a, a, a smattering of these. We use it for like the employee recognition, you know, staff excellence award nomination process is to the employee as well. And and during COVID, uh, we had, uh, we set aside funding for um, uh, technology support for faculty, you know, because a lot of faculty, they had to move their courses online so they can apply for technology support. Uh, through our office and we use InfoReady for that as well. Oh, that's massive disruptions during a pandemic, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, here's another question for you about more communication uh, related to the PIF on campus. Did you find it challenging to shift the mentality of those requesters who would find it easier to send an ad hoc request and get an, an immediate response to the new PIF process, which seems to take a little longer. Uh, what communication was used to help facilitate, facilitate the shift? I think we need leadership buy-in, right? So when they come to the provost or to our bosses and they request it. Uh, but I think at this time, you know, we having it twice a year and also they know when it's going to kind of be announced and open. Uh, I think that's, uh, um, that helps. But I think folks also find some kind of pride when they actually get awarded through fifth competition, competitive process. And, uh, and you know, with, with the campus-wide communication that we do, uh, articles to highlight uh, accomplishments. So, we feature we feature a successful initiative uh, and programs in in our news. I think they they can get sort of like that um, incentive to submit it through through this process. I mean, we still get some ad hoc because you know we, we have twenty four million allocation from PIF, and then about three million is through the competitive competitive uh, co competitive uh, process. But the ad hoc requests are more usually very, very strategic, right? Uh, and not like, you know, sometimes sometimes we get 15,000 requests. If, you know, like, is that really? So this is where we, okay, you want 15,000, please go to competitive review. So um, I think a lot of a lot of communication highlight accomplishment uh, to help facilitate that, that shift and then get the leadership buy-in to continue you know, the kind of encourage them to submit their request through this uh, avenue. Leadership buy-in, always so important. <laughs> yes, yes. 
we're so lucky uh, our provos you know and they're actually this is you know we talk about our favorite time of the year is when we have we can award the PIF funding that's great so, so on the topic of leadership buy-in <laughs> if they buy in they promote it but they also want to see results because they're investing two to three million dollars in this fund right uh could you talk a little bit more uh about the types of metrics leadership's looking for when you're reporting outcomes and results to them so I mentioned earlier in the evaluation criteria, we evaluate proposal based on, you know, return of investment or value investment because sometimes they're intangible. Like, um, and then we ask them to uh, to give us metric to measure their success and also finding sustainability. So already, you know, the 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 proposal that you fund, they have already uh, kind of a. a a clear ROI or VOI and how they can measure it, how can they measure their own success. So we use the progress report uh, feature in Fority to uh, get those progress report. And in the progress report, we specifically ask what their actual versus expected outcomes, including their strategic impacts and how they measure it. So uh, within those report, we usually see, you know, we got fifth, last year to develop this and then we got additional funding from nsf for a million dollar so those are the stories that we get from from those uh, progress report or if their proposal was to increase student retention and graduation uh in a department or a or a, a program you know they put their goal for example that we want to increase by i don't know 15 percent you know uh so they're able, like we were able to, you know, meet our goal. Uh, we have this uh, program that we funded, the vertically integrated projects. So they're thinking like, we want to achieve uh, 500 student credit hours by the end of, you know, fiscal year 2023. So they, in the report they mentioned with some supporting data that we are able to achieve uh, that goal. So in terms of ROI, it kind of vary between proposals because some of them are not very tangible or tangible. So uh, that's why uh, all the reports are available for campus community to look at. So we, we publish annual report for Provos Investment Fund that includes all those individual reports from all the funded proposal. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, it, it, it's so important at the end of the day to be able to show those results, to be able to continue to offer this to, to the campus community. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we've got another question related to funding sources. I think you already answered this in, in part of this uh, in a previous question, um, but you might be able to elaborate now. Do you split the costs among the organizations and departments within the university? So uh, I'm aware that at the moment, Research Innovation and Impacts Office, uh, they have um, um, subscription with InfoReady and we sl split the costs with them. And I know that we try to onboard, I know College of Social and Behavioral Sciences onboarded, they're using uh, InfoReady as well. So at the moment we split the cost, but we're hoping that you know if we show a lot of usage, then we become uh, the it becomes an enterprise level system, right? Uh, but we need to kind of show usage first before it becomes enterprise level system. So yes, at the moment we we split we split the cost. But what I'm doing at the moment because you know like the honor scholar, for example, they have faculty award, but you know, they they may not be able to buy their own subscription. So what I've been doing is that I help them put their faculty awards for honors in our microsite because honors college report to the provost. So uh, we are able to kind of like once a year type of competition, uh, I help them to post it on, on ours. The same thing with our foundation. 
they have um, award or, or funding opportunities uh, three times a year that I uh, help them to put it in our company, our um, site. And, you know, these also help getting traffic to our site too. So this is about communication again, you know, like people know more about the Progress Investment Fund. And then what's, what's nice is that if they cannot get funding from Progress Investment Fund, there are other funding opportunities from our, from our research office, from the foundation, and from various other sources that are already posted on our Arizona Cultivate. Thanks so much, Nina. Um, I'm going to provide a little extra information for the audience. Nina mentioned the, the term microsite. You know, microsite is another landing page off of the main homepage. So it becomes a, a kind of like a portal for that specific audience uh, that the microsite's been branded for. So Provost Office, for example, will have this microsite and the language on that microsite homepage is specifically for the provost office and all the opportunities listed there are only for the provost office and even the URL ending uh, is, will say provost office so she, Nina can send people directly to her, her uh, info ready page. Uh, we're almost out of time here. Um, so here's a quick question. This is, I, Go with, when you you were you were presenting, and I I thought of this one. This, this is just from from Carlos. Do you seek to to balance out the funding across all the different relevant operational areas, or is it just dependent on what types of proposals you get and their quality? We we try to balance out between the different five operational criteria, right? This why because you know by the time you get that fifteen, it's so hard to to decide which one to fund, right? That's why we oftentimes we ended up funding more than a million. But we try to balance out that there is at least one winner, I call it winner, one proposal in each category. And then the other strong, you know, if there is one that is kind of like a research impact, there is one that is strong, then we fund that. Or so this is uh, our new collaboration with Back Launch Arizona. If there is like into a property, intellectual intellectual property or commercialization, we partner with them that they will fund it instead of provost. So we try to seek those if you know six other, and then if there are ones that uh, that matches with like our Hispanic Serving Institution initiative, we try to reach out to the HSI to see if they can fund it. So. Uh, so we try to approve as many as we can and try to get additional funding. That's great. No, that, it's nimble, right? Thinking mm -hmm. of all the different resources and and uh, that you can leverage to help the campus community there. Okay, uh, we've run out of time for questions, uh, and so we're we're going to wrap it up here. Um, Nina, thank you so much for. Uh, presenting on the Provost Initiative Fund at the University of Arizona. Great presentation. I think everyone uh, on the webinar really appreciated it. Um, we have, I told you we do webinars all the time. And next week we actually have a training webinar. Um, this is targeted more towards newer admins and it's tips before launching your first competition. So I told, I told you we do webinars all the time. Uh, and so that's, uh, next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then if you do have more questions about InfoReady, uh, we've got that survey uh, that up appears after you log off the, the webinar. Uh, but you can also contact my colleague, Max Dinerman, if you're not using InfoReady and, and are considering it. Uh, if you if your institution's already using InfoReady, you just have more support technical questions, contact me or the support team. Our email addresses and phone numbers are on the screen. And then uh, just to the audience, thank you for your time today and attending the webinar. Yes, thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.